Welcome to Peak Pool Chico. We have a very special guest with us today. As the senior senator from Massachusetts since 2013, she has focused on consumer protection, economic opportunity, and the social safety net. In 2017, she published her 11th book, This Fight is Our Fight, The Battle to Save America's Middle Class, where she argues for stronger federal social programs and increased investment in education for, welcome, for working families. Please welcome Senator Elizabeth Warren. Senator, thank you so much. For so us good today. to be here. Thank you for having me. And really great news this morning that uh, the uh, Secretary uh, Castro endorsed you. Yes, yes. I cannot tell you how pleased I am. Uh, Julian Castro is just a remarkable man. And I uh, worked with him back when he was Secretary at HUD working in the Obama administration. And uh, when I had first started out in the Senate, we had a lot of issues that overlapped around families and the need for safe and affordable and secure housing. But also, we'd have lunch, we'd talk about just all of the issues, about opportunity in America, and how if the government made just a few investments in the right places, we could really expand opportunity not just for those at the top, but we could really expand opportunity for all of our people, for all of our children. And that's what drew us together. We've been friends since then. He's been remarkable in this campaign. Were you surprised this morning when you saw that, or did you? So we have been talking, you know, I'll just be blunt. I was very sorry that uh, the secretary uh, wasn't able to stay in the race longer, but I know the pressures were a lot, and he said it just wasn't the right time. But to be able to welcome him as a partner in this fight is really important to me. Um, we share a lot of the same values, and we're going to be in this fight together, and I, I just think Julian is terrific. It's, it's a wonderful endorsement because he represents this very interesting uh, rising force in America, which yes. is the multicultural voice. And in an America that is so diverse, more diverse than it's ever been in its history, what makes you the right candidate uh, to lead such a pluralistic nation? You know, I believe that our real potential strength as a country is our differences. And I mean that in every sense, that immigration, does not make us weaker, it makes us stronger. That the fact that we hear voices from men and from women, that we hear voices from young people and from seniors, that we hear the voices of people who come from a wide variety of backgrounds, and that they contribute to the kind of America in which everybody gets heard and everybody gets a shot, everybody gets a chance, everybody gets a chance at a first-rate education. Everybody gets a chance to build some economic security. Everybody gets a chance to take care of themselves and the people they love. That's the America we can build together. Your fight is my fight, my fight is your fight. We'll do it together. But we're also arguably as divided as we've ever been as a country. What are some of the difficulties that you see in repairing these divisions? You know, I think we have to start with just a blunt fact. And that is, Donald Trump wants to turn people against people. He wants to turn white against black and brown. He wants to turn Christian against Muslim and Jew. He wants to turn straight against gay and trans particularly. He wants to turn everyone against immigrants. And the reason for that is that he seems to believe that as long as we're all fighting each other, then nobody will notice that Donald Trump and his corrupt buddies are stealing both our wealth and our dignity as a nation. I think 2020 is our chance to turn that around, to say that we do embrace each other's fights, that we do embrace building a stronger America together. We do embrace investing, not just in some of our kids, but in all of our kids. This is perfect. We found a quote um, that's attributed to the Aboriginal artist Lilla Watson. Uh -huh. And it goes like this. 
If you have come to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. How will you convince Democrats and Republicans, the wealthy and the working class, the liberal and the conservative, that our liberation is bound together? So it's a, that's a wonderful framing of it. You know, let me put it this way. Um, I was born and raised in Oklahoma. Uh, my family didn't have much. Uh, I have three much older brothers, and they're all retired now. They're all back in Oklahoma. They're always giving me advice. You know how older brothers yeah. are. Um, one of my brothers is a Democrat. Two are Republicans. So when we get together, we can take to our corners, uh, and I can do the Democratic talking points, and, and along with one of my brothers, and the other two can do the Republican talking points, and we could stay okay. divided. Two and two. Right. Two and two. Um, but the other way is when we change the conversation a little bit. So for example, uh, I was just with my brothers a couple of weeks ago, and we started talking about Amazon. Mm -hmm. And uh, not about getting your coffee maker mm -hmm. delivered, but about the fact that last year Amazon made over $10 billion in profits. That was their own internal public mm -hmm. report. And you know how much they paid in taxes? Zero. Zero. Now, my Republican and Democratic mm -hmm. brothers come together and say, you know, that's just not fair. It, somebody's got to pay to keep this country going. Somebody's got to keep the roads and bridges paved. Somebody's got to keep our schools open. Somebody's got to pay for our defense. They pay their taxes. They don't think it's right that the loopholes exist, that the guys at the very tip top don't have to pay their fair share. And why wouldn't they have to? The answer is just corruption. Mm -hmm. They've lobbied Congress. They've paid for lobbyists and experts and lawyers and PR firms until they've gotten the laws tilted a little in their favor and then a little more and then a little more. And now they pay nothing. Mm -hmm. And it falls on everyone else. I think something we all come back to is about fairness. And what we want is a little more fairness in this system. We want to say everybody pays a fair share. And then here's the thing, that'll give us enough to be able to invest in childcare for all of our babies, uh, pre-K for every three-year-old and four-year-old, enough to help us cancel student loan debt, enough to make technical school, two-year college, four-year college tuition free, enough to build a future for an entire generation of young people. I'm so glad that you brought up that example of Amazon because as you know, they almost came to New York, yeah. to my borough where I live in Queens, and uh, one of the arguments that, that one of the pe reasons people were upset that they were leaving was because the counter argument was that they were creating all these jobs and that taxing those workers would be what would raise the money and the taxes that was needed. What do you think about that argument? Is you that know, still unfair? I, I, I have to tell you, I watched that whole Amazon, where will we go, play okay. out. The same way I watched the movie Hunger Games. Mm. You know, you put a bunch of cities, towns that are trying to get jobs, trying to build an economy, by offering bigger and bigger breaks mm -hmm. to a giant that makes billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. And they're all competing with each other, mm -hmm. right? And think about that. Think about what that means for a small business. Mm -hmm. You know, there are a lot of ways to grow an economy. One of them is small businesses, mm -hmm. right? But small businesses aren't getting the kind of offers that Amazon was getting. No taxes will help refurbish your building, will build things you need in front of your buildings. Think about that. That the offer was, we're going to help those who've already made it big, the rich and the powerful, get richer and more powerful and hope that, that some of that will trickle down right. for everyone else. Well, We've basically had nearly 40 years of trickle-down economics, and I just want to say it right out. It has been a monumental failure. Mm. Trickle-down economics is about making the rich and the powerful richer and more powerful. Mm. Richer by cutting their taxes and more powerful by cutting the regulations that should apply. And the consequence of that is we've had an economy that's grown 
but the new income produced in that economy, nearly 100% of it has been sucked up mm -hmm. to the top, leaving hardworking families struggling to pay for housing and health care and child care and sending a kid off to school. So here's my basic idea. I, I'll give you one example. Two cent wealth tax. A tax on the big fortunes in this country. More than 50 million dollars. Your first 50 million is free and clear. Mm -hmm. But on your 50 millionth and first, you've got to pitch in two cents. And two cents on every dollar after that. You hit a billion, a few more pennies. Mm -hmm. What could we do with that money. Mm -hmm. That would be enough money for universal childcare, every baby in this country, universal pre-K. Stop exploiting the people who do that work, largely women, largely black and brown women, and raise the wages of every childcare worker and preschool teacher in America. It would be enough money in addition to that to put $800 billion into our public schools, quadruple the funding for Title I schools that are educating children that come from low-income households. Um, fully fund IDEA, which means children with disabilities, would get the full educational opportunities they need. Cover tuition-free technical school, two-year college, four-year college for every kid who wants to get an education. Put $50 billion into our historically black colleges and universities and minority serving institutions and cancel student loan debt for 43 million Americans. Think of it that way. There's this handful, one tenth of one percent that have such great fortunes that if they just pitch in two cents, an entire generation of young people would have a chance at a first-rate education and to build a life going forward. It's about basic fairness, it's about our values, it's about the country we want to be. And it's amazing you so clearly have done the homework and laid out the plan and explained it. Why is it scaring so many Americans across income levels to think that a wealth, it's essentially a wealth tax, to think that, why is it that their argument is still so strong that a wealth tax would cause the kind of stagnation we're seeing in Europe right now? So I'll, I'll make a couple of points here. The first is that the wealth tax is actually very popular. So, and when I say popular, it's not just a majority of Democrats that like it. It's a majority of independents and a majority of Republicans. Not Republicans in Congress, but Republicans across this country. People get it. The system isn't fair. And, it, and by the way, when I say it's not fair, understand this. The 99% last year paid about 7.2% of their total income in, or total wealth in taxes. That's across the board on average. That top one tenth of 1% paid less than half as much about 3.2%. So when I ask them to pitch in two cents, that still means they're getting a better deal than everyone else. That's the first part. The second is you've got to remember, they got a lot of money. Mm. And that means they hire a lot of PR firms, they get out and talk about it on TV. This notion that, oh my gosh, we can't do that. But I think not just the majority, but a big majority of Americans said, wait a minute, we have a choice to make. Are we gonna say the richest folks in this country, tiny number of people, get to keep it all mm. and get to keep growing their wealth? You know, their wealth is growing. 4%, mm -hmm. 6%, 8%, 10% a year. Or do we ask them just don't grow it quite so fast and pitch in that money so a whole generation of young people from our babies to our, our post high school technical and college kids so they can all get a real chance in this world. Mm -hmm. Do you think there has been any sexism at play in the media narrative of your campaign, Losing Steam? You know, it, this is a tough one. For me, I've worked in money fields for a long time. Mm -hmm. So from the time I first got into teaching law school, I was often the only woman in the room, one of two maybe. But you know, you just gotta put your head down and do your work. 
that's, that's what it's about. Because after all, I know why I'm in this fight. Um, I'm somebody whose daddy ended up as a janitor. My mom worked minimum wage at Sears. My three older brothers all went off to the military. That was, that was their ticket to America's middle class and their chance to serve. But for me, my dream was to be a public school teacher. And when I graduated high school, we didn't have the money for college application, much less to send me off to university. But my big chance was a commuter college that cost $50 a semester. I finished my four-year diploma. I became a special education teacher, and it opened one door after another for me. I'm in this fight, not for myself, I'm in this fight because I want that kind of opportunity that's just not out there now. I want that kind of opportunity available to every kid in this country. Senator, what are you looking for um, in a running mate? Oh, someone who'll fight the fight alongside me, someone who believes from the heart, someone who's ready to jump in all the way. Well, thank you so much. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm so and glad to be thank here. Thank you for your passion and your answers, and we're very excited to follow your campaign. So, I know you brought some <laughs> What's this? She has a hat that oh. she wanted to get your... Let me see. <laughs> oh, this is terrific. Do you want me to sign it? Yeah.